uh, along those lines, I just had a report last week, uh, two weeks ago, Friday, um, of a patient who was doing magnificently well, had a cardiac history, doing magnificently well, all of his insulin resistance parameters getting better. And I get a letter from his doctor stamped on his blood work that says, this is dangerous. This, pa this patient is at high risk for a, uh, another heart attack. I strongly recommend a low fat vegetarian diet and he should be taking statins. In fact, probably warrants an intravenous statin or not intravenous, yep. but in, uh, injectable statin. And, yep. and when I looked at this, I don't have that in front of me, but it's, it's written on top of his blood work that I just a week before had gone over with this patient and said, my God, your blood work looks beautiful. Yes, your LDL is high. We predicted that, we expected that. That's a wonderful thing. And, and yet it just boggles my mind that even when that mother goes back to that doctor and says, here's what I did, here's the result, the cognitive dissonance is such that it's impossible to think otherwise that maybe what the advice you're giving to people is incorrect. I see that with endocrinologists and diabetes all the time. But yep. uh, uh, Ken, along those lines, um, I, and, and I really appreciate your emotion because it's, it's rare that doctors have that. That was a pleasant emotion. That was a beautiful emotion. Most of our emotions are frustration, fear. We, we fear not following the guidelines. We fear the punitive action of our peers. We, we fear, fear, fear. And it's awful to live in that world. And the only thing that gives us buoyancy are the results that contradict the fear that they're mongering amongst us. Uh, every day I see patients who are doing wonderfully well. Why should I care about their LDL? But having said that, we also need to clean house. And I, I think I've been over the last few months, and, and one of the reasons I really asked to talk to you about this, because I, as a, as a physician that's, that's in the trenches that understands blood work and so many people do not do that in the keto space. They don't have that clinical experience. They don't know the broader blood work. Um, and, and by the way, I just want to throw props out here. There's a, a group of, uh, and we're in the same group, I think, uh, Nick Norwitz, Dave Feldman, Dave Diamond, have just published a beautiful article looking at lean mass hyperresponders. Uh, and I don't want to go into this in detail where they, they've shown that LDL, high levels of LDL in the face of otherwise healthy triglycerides and HDL poses no cardiovascular risk. And in my practice, I actually take it a step further. And I would tell you that a low triglyceride, high HDL, high LDL is a desirable uh, lipid blood work that you want to see because it's a testament to the fact that you are insulin sensitive. And uh, But we focused so heavily on countering the lipid argument that we may have slightly lost track. And I've got some evidence from my practice uh, where we see literally thousands of patients, and a lot of my patients are what I call keto veterans, often carnival veterans. So these are people that have, as you said earlier on, um, there's a bell curve to everything. And uh, sometimes we start out in the insulin resistant world with that curve being all the way over to one side. And sometimes that pendulum can swing all the way over to the opposite side. And I'm seeing evidence of that. And the part that I'm wrestling with is how do we bring that, the, our recommendations back to, and is there a modification of what's called the proper human diet? And I'm going to read some evidence to you in a second, but one of the things that's evolved, and I think you've been in this for a long time like I have, I started in the Atkins, post-Atkins era, where it was low carb, fat's okay, but we really focused on protein. So it was a low carb, eat as much protein as you want to, and if the fat comes with it, eat that. And Circa 2010, 2012, um, we migrated more to really advocating for low carb, high fat. And I still believe that that is the single best therapeutic approach. But the exclusive value to my mind of a low carbohydrate, high fat diet is to treat insulin resistance and all the diseases that come along with that, including obesity, diabetes, the metabolic diseases. But that is a therapeutic dietary intervention that goes from standard American or industrial diet all the way across to a low carb, high fat diet. And really what you're doing is replacing the caloric value of sugar with a caloric value of fat. Protein, Zoe Harkham talks about this quite a bit. The protein amount in both of those spectrum diets is about the same at 30%. But you're going from 70 to 80% carbohydrate in most of my patients' diets to a Above 35% is a high fat diet, but these folks are consuming 60, 70, almost 80% of fat and adding fat to everything. And 
we've not really looked at that. We've accepted that that's healthy and okay, but maybe it isn't. So I'm going to read to you. I do a lot of blood work and I do very extensive blood work repetitively. So I've got this beautiful record of patients and I'm going to read to you two patients. Now, these patients are almost identical in terms of age, sex. One's 59, the other one is 60 or 61, um, both male. They are both pretty much carnivore veterans. So they've been on a ketogenic diet for five to seven years. And then slowly, like you and I, not intentionally, but allowed ourselves for a variety of positive reasons to migrate more toward being carnivore dominant. Uh, one of them is a pure carnivore. The other one's uh, about 95% carnivore. And I've got extensive blood work. I'm just going to read through some salient numbers. And I'm going to do the comparison. So bear with me. The first thing we'll look at is blood glucose. And I've got in one patient a blood glucose of 101, 101 slightly abnormal. The other one's blood sugar is 80. Um, the next thing we'll look at is, uh, as we go through, electrolytes are all fine. BUN, in, and the, the first number will always be the same person, and the second number will be the same person. BUN of 29, BUN of 20. Uric acid of 6.9, uric acid of 4.6. Um, we've got AST, let me see, uh, liver numbers, which I look for for fatty liver. Uh, where are they? Here we go. I had them here a second ago. There's just tons of paperwork here. Um, by the way, both of these patients are on thyroid medication for Hashimoto's. Okay. Um, and about the same uh, dosing. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Alkfos, uh, 83, AST, 34, ALT, 56 versus Alkfos, 48, AST 14, ALT 18. So big shift there. Um, let's look at some other numbers. The next number we'll look at is creatinine and GFR. Creatinine 1.9, GFR 60. Creatinine, uh, where's his creatinine? Uh, creatinine 0.9. So a one a whole one percentage point difference. Uh, GFR 80, uh, GFR 99. Um, then we look at, let's go look to hemoglobin A1C, because this is pretty striking. Hemoglobin A1C of 61, uh, sorry, 6.1. Hemoglobin A1C of 4.5. Okay. Um, we can look at some of the thyroid hormones. Both of them show uh, um, slightly low T3s, uh, free T3, total T3. TSH is low, though, so it's not a responsive thing. Both of them are have been taking some iodine supplementation. Um, and triglycerides on both these? Well, I'll, yeah. be, I'll get to the lipids in a second. So okay. uh, we'll hit the, the lipid profile. Uh, let's go there now. So um, uh, the one had, uh, well, I won't talk about the thyroglobulin antibodies and the, and the Hashimoto's antibodies. That's a segue. That, that's, a, that's a separate component. Let's look at cholesterol. In the first one, 414. The second one, 212. That's total cholesterol. HDL, um, HDL is 95 in the first one. HDL is 8-0 in the second one. Triglycerides are 54 in the first one and 53 in the second one. LDL cholesterol is 388 in the, in the first one. They are 142 in the second one. Now, the next thing I'm going to read you is also an astounding number. I think I've, I've covered, I, I've got so much blood work on these folks, but I've covered the salient ones. There's one in particular that I want to read to you, and that is... Actually, both of these patients, Ken, by the way, are thyroid suppressed. Both of them, their T3s are on the low side, 0.56 and 0.11. So they're a little bit overdosed on their medication. We hadn't started bringing them up. Both of them are, uh, the first one is in a trace of ketosis. The second one is one plus ketosis in the urine. It's not a great screen, but it's in the urine. Uh, right. White count in the first one is 6.7. White count in the second one is 4.9. And then the big one here. Uh, C peptide for the first one is 0.67. C peptide for the uh, second one is 0.11. Uh, insulin is uh, 3.6, and insulin is. Where's his insulin? A1C is 4.5. Insulin is 2.7. Okay, so for those, those these are just the, the, the numbers, but basically these patients are both um, insulin sensitive. They've got, both got very, very low insulins and C-peptides. The one has a slightly higher blood sugar than the other. 
but the blood sugars are all are both pretty good, but there's about a 20 point difference. Normal blood sugar being around 83 to 85. Um, the other component is their lipid paradigm is also speaks to insulin sensitivity. High triglyceride, low HDL. The one is a lean mass hyper responder with that very high LDL. The other one has an elevated LDL. Most doctors would throw statins at that person. Um, both of them are identical in terms of their diet and, and pretty much the same period. Both of them are authoritarian, so I can trust what they tell me. So here's the difference. Well, well first of all, let, let me stop there and then I'll, I'll, I'll explain something to you. What are the good things? What are the concerns? By the way, the first one has a fatty liver and has an elevated A1C. The second one has a normal liver with those AST, a normal non-inflamed liver and obviously, I mean, a ridiculously low A1C of 4.5. So what are your thoughts on this? And I know it's complex. I'm asking you to put you on the spot a little bit, but what are your thoughts off the top, top of your head? Yeah, I think obviously the second patient is much more metabolically healthy. Um, the, the elevated uh, hemoglobin A1C in the first patient in light of a very good triglyceride and a very good fasting insulin and C-peptide uh, would make you uh, pause and say, what's going on there? Because it's really hard to accuse this patient of eating hidden carbohydrates. Well, the insulin do. and C peptides really low, so that's not. That's right. That's yeah, not exactly. And their triglycerides are really low, so this is not someone. Because very often I'll see somebody with a six one, and they'll say I'm carnivore, but then their triglycerides are two hundred ninety five, and their and their C peptide is twelve, and I'm like, no, you're not but a carnivore. I, I love what you just said because, you know, people can tell me what they tell me. The numbers don't lie. Right. And you can't achieve these numbers without being a veteran carnivore or a veteran keto ultra low carbohydrate person. Yep. The number, so there must be something wrong with that A1C of 6.1. Well, I think the hemoglobin A1C of 6.1 says that there is a problem somewhere. And the other thing also that I alluded to that nobody really looks at is the three, the three numbers I look at for nitrogen metabolism, creatinine, urea, and um, uric acid. All three of those numbers are abnormal. Yep. OK, so and, and this is something I'm seeing. I've got a cohort. I've got several thousand patients with similar blood work to the first patient, several thousand can. And they're all carnival veterans or keto veterans. I have uh, I've got a, a hundred in the group that I'm studying. And I, I've spoken to Dave Feldman. I've spoken to Dave. I've spoken to all the experts in lipid metabolism. And we don't, haven't been able to reconcile this. Why is this the case? Because they have done everything we asked them to. Re and both of these guys started as insulin resistant, uh, industrialized standard American diet folks, and they've migrated to this over the last decade. So these are, guys are a decade or so into this whole process, keto and then carnivore. Um, so when I look at them, they both eat a very similar diet, about 30, 30 35% fat, uh, sorry, a 30 to 35% protein and a very high fat diet. Neither of them are big into exercise. They both try their best to be physically active, but neither of them would consider themselves to be an athlete. Right. So, uh, and they're both on thyroid medication. They, they both take supplementation. Their vitamin Ds were high and their B12s were high, but they both take um, the same multivitamin and a vitamin, uh, 5,000 units of D3 with K2. Um, but that's not, that's not in the picture. But uh, from a, uh, a medication perspective, they're, they're pretty much exactly the same. And here's the difference. Um, because... It, why are they not alike? And the difference is this, the second patient, when he was, he's now, uh, he's 61. When he was six years old, six years old, he was diagnosed with type one diabetes, okay? His A1Cs have been as high as 13 and he's now at 4.5. The second one has never had a history of diabetes. He's been insulin, he's been insulin resistant, yes. But he improved, and if I looked at his, the lowest A1C he got to was 5.1, and he's now up at 6.1. So what has happened? And I've got cohorts of these patients. I'm using these. I just happened to pull them out before our discussion. I've got seven patients, seven type ones, that are all the same in this cohort, and the other group are all in the same cohort as the first group. And I'm concerned. Not I don't care about the LDL. I love the LDL. I love their lipid profile. Um, 
In fact, the diabetic guy has a higher CAC score. I don't recall what it was, but it's in that moderate group because he was sick for such a long time. The other one has a, a CAC score below 100. I think it's, it's in the 8 to 10 range. It's, it's really, really good. So I'm not worried about cardiovascular health, but here's the issue. These folks are both so fat adapted that they are unable to mount an insulin response. And even when I, I tested, I did a glucose tolerance test on uh, the first patient, and it's almost flat. Uh, the insulin does not respond because their cells do not demand sugar. The second guy, the type one diabetic, is artificially keeping his blood sugar at 80 by giving himself boluses of insulin. So the first patient, their pancreas has just gone quiet and they're living in an almost perpetual state of glucagon where they're using fat all the time because when you eat fat, it goes straight to your fat cells and then get used from there. It doesn't typically go to the liver. The protein goes there and because they're not using so uh, uh, the sugar that the pro excess protein becomes in the liver, it's being converted to fat. That's why they got the fatty liver again. So they almost look like they're insulin sensitive. But in fact, they're actually got a, a diabetic picture, a type one diabetic picture. So I've called these patients glucose sparing they really have very little need to use sugar and protein resistant because they're not even using the stores from the protein. They don't exercise a lot. So their muscle glycogen is replenished. The hepatic glycogen is okay. They don't know what, their body doesn't know what to do with the sugar and they can't mount an insulin response to get it into their cells because insulin is just dormant. And, and that's a concern for me. And I've got not just one, I started to see this as a trend. And I think that one of the concerns I have with the, the recent recommendations that we've made is that a low carbohydrate, high fat diet is a good diet to correct insulin sensitive, to, to become insulin sensitive. But once you're there, you do want to, at certain meals, trigger an insulin response. And the way you trigger that is by having either lean protein without the fat, because these guys are so fat adapted, their body's seeking fat all the time. By the way, their BMIs are 23.8 and 24.1. So they're both lean, lean mass. Uh, one's a hyper responder, one's a high responder. Um, but the point is that they uh, are so comfortable using fat, they have no need for sugar. And the type one diabetic, the second guy is forcing sugar into its cells with that extra insulin. Whereas the first one's pancreas is not responding at all. And I have some concerns about our long-term massive overconsumption of, of fat in the 70, 80% range. Just like we have, this all started with our concerns of people having sugar in the 70 to 80% of diet and then excessive to become obese. But if that percentage is high, you may be a TOFI diabetic where you're not, you might be slightly overweight but have diabetes because you're not eating massive mountains of sugar. It's the percentage in your diet that's high. The same thing here is that this fat, you can't eat fat to the point you become fat. That's the beauty about this. But the percentage of fat that they're intentionally adding to their food may be a concern. And I'm starting to modify and adapt my diet recommendations for these folks to be a little bit more lean on some of their meals. And if they've never had a carbohydrate problem per se, is to add in some berries, some uh, uh, natural, I hate the word natural because it's such a bad word, but some uh, starches like a potato or a sweet potato from time to time to trigger that instant response. I certainly don't do that with my addicts, but this is something I'm just seeing. I don't know what the right therapeutic approach is, but there are large cohorts of these patients out there. And I think we may have mistakenly created the, the long-term trajectory that eat as much fat, fat is good, throw butter in your coffee, soak everything in fat. You know, even a guy like Sean Baker, when he cooks a steak, he grills it and the fat leaks out. Plus he's exercising like crazy. Sure. So I just want to present these two because it's, this is new information. This is new data that I'm still yeah. trying to wrap my head around. What are your yeah. thoughts? What are your, so when it comes, and I asked you this question earlier on, or, or at a different time, what's the difference between a low carb, high fat diet and the proper human diet? And so I and when I was uh, coming up with this this concept, this paradigm, if you will, that's why I made the proper human diet a spectrum and not just one diet for everyone. I think that there is probably just like there's a normal distribution curve for everything. 
I think there's probably a normal distribution curve of not only carbohydrate tolerance, but perhaps uh, there might be in some genetic, uh, some ethnic populations, there might be a need for some small amount. So, so the, the proper human diet can range from as close to zero grams of carbohydrates a day all the way up to some young metabolically healthy, maybe of certain uh, genetic propensities, maybe up to 100 total grams of carbs a day, all real whole food, one ingredient carbohydrates. Uh, like you said, berries, nuts, uh, you know, a yam, some vegetables. And then secondly, I've never been a, an, a, a just a 100% advocate of low carb, high fat. Uh, when when Ted Naiman wrote his book, The P.E. Diet, a lot of people wanted me to, to pile on him and, and yell at him and, and, you know, denigrate him. And, and I refused to do so, and I still refuse to do so, because I think there's probably a subset of people who will do better on a high protein, moderate fat, yet still very, very low carbohydrate diet. Mm. And I think the, that may be the patient subpopulation that you're teasing out with the, the, the anecdotes that you found, this may be that, that little subset that does, does better on a higher protein, moderate fat. And so they're not going to be adding fat to everything and cooking in fat and putting fat on top and fat on their coffee, but they're still going to be eating a very low carbohydrate diet. And so I, I, think, that, I think when you look at this, you've got to have room in any kind of dietary paradigm. You've got to have room for the distribution curve. And there's going to be, I think the majority of people, especially in the beginning, do better on a high fat, moderate protein. Absolutely. Keto. There's no, no question. Yeah. That's, but but that long is term, that is therapeutic. That's right. Long term, there might be a certain percentage of people who do better on high protein, moderate fat. I've never argued that point. I think, I think that that's probably true. And I don't know what that percentage is. And you, you might could give us a rough f- estimation by, you know, dividing your total patient database by what the, however many you've got that seem to fit that picture. Well, you know, what's interesting, Ken, for me, it's a question of time. And it's also a question of truth. There are some folks out there that the numbers don't tell the truth. We've talked about that already. And you know that our more permissive patients really can't effectively be fastidious about being pure carnival or pure keto. And there's always an element, they try really hard, and I'm not, this is not a criticism, but we know that there's that population that still has a significant presence of carbohydrates. Then there's this group, which are my authoritarian patients, and they are, the beauty about authoritarianism is you ask them to do something, and they do it to the nth plus one degree. So they're way, way out there, and you can trust that, but that also, I think, represents a liability. So if you've got this bell curve where, you should be eating, you're eating a ton of sugar and now you're eating a ton of fat. We want to shift that a little bit toward the middle. But the other thing also that I thought about a lot, and, and you've mentioned that a few times through this discussion, is the concept of going back ancestrally. And if we go back to the pre-farming, pre-herding era, or if you look at what any uh, a carnivore animal eats, be it a reptile, be it a raptor, or be it a mammal carnivore, they're not eating what we eat. In other words, the big difference between a gazelle and a cow is the amount of fat that's inherent in the food that they eat. And in fact, the, the, uh, I'll give you just my two cents worth that I've thought a lot about this. But in nature, the animals that we eat, the wild animals, are very, very lean in their musculature. The fat tends to be in the thorax and the abdomen. We go for that first. It's in the organs. We eat the organs. But then the majority of the animal that we eat is lean protein. So you're getting that fluctuation of some fat, some micronutrients in the organs, and then uh, using a uh, the protein of which the excess becomes sugar. That's why it's not necessary to eat carbohydrates. And I think we haven't quite replicated that when we're eating a lot of cows and a lot of lambs and, and, and mutton. And, um, you know, we're eating, we're specifically seeking out the highest fat animals, and we've become so good at fattening them up. I think the other thing that happened to people like you and me in this country, and, and as I talk in more and more internationally, I realize that in this country, we don't just slaughter animals and eat them. What we do is we slaughter animals and then remove all the fat, and then we eat them. If you look at New Zealand and Australian lamb chops and South African lamb chops that you buy in this country, it's this little chunk of red meat and there's no fat. 
you go to Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, and you've got this big rind of fat on the outside that comes with it. We take the fat out of our milk and call it full cream milk. In the rest of the world, it's called a whole milk. Oh, uh, it's called whole milk because I can't remember which country is which, but where they, they just pasteurize the milk as it comes out of the cow. They don't take the cream off. Um, we eat the white, white meat to the chicken with the skin gone. So what happened is in this country, the meat that we're eating is relatively devoid of fat. So when we went therapeutic as physicians that do what you and I do, as we advocated from this country, we said, hey guys, add the fat back, add butter in, use olive oil, use coconut oil, use cheese, use dairy, use bacon to fatten up the food to make up for where the fat isn't. Um, whereas overseas, you can still get higher fat or leaner product, which is basically where we killed the animal, took the skin off and, and cut it up and put it in front of us. The other person that I talked to a while ago, who's really a phenomenal resource is Richard Bernstein. And Richard is 83 years old. He's a type one diabetic who's lived a diabetic life for 50 years. And he's one of the first advocates for uh, a low carbohydrate diet for, for diabetics, particularly type ones. And what Richard says, and he grew up in an era before we removed fat from our food like we fastidiously do in this country. And he said, look, don't add fat to your food. Just eat the meat as it comes and select the meat as it comes. And I think that ratio is reasonable, particularly <clears throat> time to time you have the lean meat. And he uses the meat, to the protein in the meat to trigger the insulin response. Well, he doesn't have an insulin response, but to produce the sugar uh, that they actually need. And I think that, that this is something that we should be at the forefront of exploring because if we don't clean up our own house, at least understand our own data, then they are going to use these numbers to condemn us. They being the knee-jerk anti-keto people. So I, 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 the reason I'm raising this red flag, I'm carnivore myself. I, I love this way of eating. I see nothing wrong with it. But I think the proper human diet as a sustainable long-term diet for health is different to a low-carb, high-fat keto diet that's a therapeutic option for a while. Thoughts on that? Yep, that, that's very, very possible. Uh, and I, I think that it's interesting that uh, you're exactly right. Wild game in modern society for the last uh, 12,000 years has been very, very lean. There's no doubt about that. It's hard to find a fat animal in the wild. Before 12,000 years ago, that was not the case. And uh, from 12,000 years ago back to 3 million years ago, the entire world was populated with these huge, fatty megafauna. Uh, people don't realize that in, you know, on the, the North American continent, we had camels. We had horses before the Spanish brought them. There were three different kinds of elephants and mastodons. There were uh, bison, there were buffalo. There were these huge, fatty mammals all over North and South America. And that's, that's what we ate. And so I think that uh, in, in large part, our species evolved eating fatty animals. And I think it's telling that when we, uh, when we try to, when we domesticate an animal and when we uh, husband that animal and when we, we try to raise them, we try to replicate that, that fat to protein ratio. We don't raise them to be very lean. We, we go out of our way to try to make these animals have a, a, a roughly a one-to-one -one ratio of fat to protein. And that's, that's when the meat's the most delicious to us. That's when it's considered the most valuable. That's the prime cut when it's marbled really well with fat. And I think that there are healthy ways to get that fat on a domesticated animal. And there are also very unhealthy ways to get that fat on a domesticated animal. But I think that, you know, the majority of our time on this planet, we ate very fatty animals and, and only... Uh, in the last 12,000 years, have we not had access uh, on most continents to those fatty animals? Here in North America, you know, uh, a thousand years ago, you had very, very uh, non-fatty animals. That, that was your options. Unless you could get uh, trout or salmon, you weren't going to get much fat from wild game on the North American continent. But it wasn't always so. Yeah, and I, I agree with you in that regard. I think also that Historically, we did mitigate at times our diet with carbohydrates. Now, these were uh, very fibrous, starchy carbohydrates, in-season fruit and that kind of thing, and there were tiny sour things. So there was a higher degree of carbohydrate consumption. I look at that, that guy that was found, the Iceman, I think he's called the Orzo Iceman that was found in Italy, 
northern Italy, he had some grain products, some some wild grains and some ibex in his stomach when they analyzed it. So, and he was about five or six thousand years ago. Yeah, about five thousand years uh, ago. Yeah. yeah, and I think that his that his stomach contents were probably very representative of the diet of five thousand years ago. Uh, right. in the, in that part of the the untamed world, yeah, he was a hunter. He was a hunter gatherer. So I, I I do think though that for some people that pendulum has swung across. And what the experiment I've done so far with a small cohort, a couple of hundred people, maybe about three or four hundred people now uh, of lean mass hyper responders, is I've brought in some lean protein. I've cycled in some lean protein. For some of them, I've even introduced some a small amount of carbohydrates, some berries, that kind of thing, and while they're still high in their LDL, it's come down dramatically. Um, and even when their triglycerides started hitting up, which we didn't want, but that's the conversion of sugar to fat, that's come down. The A1Cs are coming back down. Their renal function, their nitrogen balance is improving. So I, I think that what we have to do is give the body substrate to make carbohydrate, even if you don't eat the carbohydrate. Sure. And and what we want, and really what, it, what the focus is, and, and this kind of comes full circle, is we need insulin. Insulin is not just an energy regulating hormone. It regulates, it's, the, it's a quarterback hormone for so many other pathways, whether it's the steroid hormone pathway, the vitamin Ds we talked about earlier, um, whether it is uh, cholesterol production, all of those things are regulated by insulin. And if you don't have an insulin response, it's almost as if you're insulin resistant. Um, so we want to be careful of the radical beyond the standard deviation types of diets. And I think the proper human diet is more kind of in that middle ground, accepting the fact that there are some people like myself who just can never ever give themselves permission to have a little bit of carbohydrate because that doesn't exist. I'm like yep. an alcoholic when it comes to carbohydrates. So I just wanted to introduce that. And I know you'll ruminate and think about this a little bit and we'll circle back and talk about that. But I think that the, the concern I have is we've been so obsessively defending high LDL that we've allowed the other numbers not to even be looked at. And, um, you know, most, most folks, when they do this, they do exclusive cholesterols. They don't look at the, at the nitrogen metabolites. They don't look at those other things. And if you don't look, you're not going to see. And, that's true. So, you know, that's the concern for me. And this is something we're going to explore more and write. It doesn't negate the fact that this is absolutely the right way to eat and drink. We just have to tweak it by new evidence and experiences that comes along.